Hello, I'm delighted to be here this morning with Ken Follett to talk about his new novel, the third in the Kingsbridge series. My pleasure. So the Kingsbridge series has yes. always taken giant leaps through history between each novel. Yes. Um, so you've catapulted the reader from the 12th century and the building of a cathedral to the 14th century and ravaged by war and plague. And now you take your readers through the fierce religious and political upheavals of, the, of 16th century Europe. So what drew you to this period in time to revisit this series? I was drawn to this when I realised that Queen Elizabeth I of England had started the very first English secret service. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason was that there were a lot of plots to assassinate her and uh, she needed protection. And so she set up the secret service to root out these assassins and these conspiracies. Uh, and it was very successful because, as we know, she died an old lady in her bed. Mm. Um, and the more I learned about it, the more kind of um, intrigued I was by how much of the paraphernalia of modern espionage was already in existence mm. in the 16th century. They had intercepted messages. Of course, they weren't instead of being intercepted on the internet, they were intercepted on bits of paper, but it was the same principle. And they had codes, uh, and they had people who could decode mm. anything uh, without having the key. So it was a little bit like the Enigma story, mm. you know. Uh, and I was kind of, uh, I thought it was good fun that all that stuff was in existence then, and I saw how I could write a historical novel that would have lots of scenes of suspense in. I think it lends itself to your, to your writing, particularly having Machiavellian figures working in the background um, and, and plotting. And, and also, it seems to be a period where ordinary people had much more access to, to power, partly through those, those shadowy networks, um, that, that they, had, they were able to influence people in a, in a greater way. I think that's true simply because there were just fewer people in the world. Mm. So, um, you know, what was the population of England in 1558? It must have been, it can't have been more than, you know, in the area of five or six million people, I would guess. And, um, you know, so, th so therefore, a much higher percentage of the population would, for example, get to meet the Queen. Uh, or even more, get to speak to her principal advisors, such as uh, Sir William Cecil, mm. who, who lived in this house with Queen Elizabeth when she was a princess, before she was yeah. the queen. Um, so, yeah, I think um, it was just a smaller world. Mm. But it's a world that's opening up. I mean, com this feels like quite a different animal, this novel, to, to the previous novels in the series, partly because of the, the scope. I mean, this takes in Europe. This is, you know, it's a, it is a novel that looks beyond the boundaries of of England? Was that part of looking at the 16th century, that, that, that the people had access to the world in a greater way? Well, it, early on in the research for the book, um, uh, I realised that this was happening in the 16th century, and it was kind of an additional reason for liking the idea. Mm. Um, uh, I discovered at one point uh, that the man who actually started the Secret Service, whose name was Sir Francis Walsingham, had been in Paris as the English ambassador during the famous massacre of St. Bartholomew, mm. uh, which I already, I, I wanted to incorporate that real life incident into the book because it's, so, it's such a tremendous tragedy and a mm. very dramatic scene. And so I was able to combine the story of Queen Elizabeth's spies and counter spies with the story of the wars of religion in France. And Walsingham was the connection. Mm, and that's the kind of thing that gladdens the heart <laughs> of an author doing research. Ah, perfect. <laughs> um, but more generally, um, England was a poor country until the 16th century when it started trading. Mm. And so the central family, the Willard family, in A Column of Fire, has cousins and other relatives in key trading cities around Europe, and that's their business. So from Kingsbridge, where the cathedral was built in the Pillars of the Earth, 
This family reaches out to Seville in Spain, and to, they have a warehouse in Calais, and they do business in Antwerp. And um, later in the novel, one of the family comes home with a German wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only was that happening, but that was the beginning of England's prosperity. Mm -hmm. And did you feel that that was a, a, a change as well from the earlier novels, that power had shifted? I mean, there's a, a lot of focus in the earlier novels on religious power, particularly around monastic power. Um, and it, there's a sense in this novel that that has shifted very much towards commerce and, and, and the, the power of money, I suppose. Um, I think that was always a conflict. But you're right. Uh, at this point, um, in the 16th century, a lot of the early supporters of Protestantism are businessmen and traders and, and um, prosperous craftsmen. They are people who are no longer willing to be told by somebody else what they ought to believe mm -hmm. because they have a certain amount of pride. Uh, they are what we might now call self-made men and self-made men never like to be told what to do. Mm. So a lot of the, of the the rebellion against the established church, the Catholic Church with its headquarters in Rome, that rebellion comes from, a lot of the time, from the commercial world. Mm. And there's a key reason for that, which is that the commercial world of the, world of the 16th century could not have existed without banking and the lending of money at interest couldn't have happened mm. but actually the lending of money at interest was a sin yes. it's called yes. usury and we find out all about it in Shakespeare's play The Merchant of Venice when the man who Shylock the man who lends money at interest is the villain of the mm. piece and a great monster mm. uh, and yet it was happening and it is happening in you know in, in exactly. your book mm. it ha happened all the time and um, so that was part of the conflict between the what you might call the nouveau riche mm -hmm. uh, in Europe and the old established order. What would you call them? The, um, the vieux riche. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you talked about the, uh, the, the massacre at Paris and um, it, it was something that I think that was a real strength of the novel. It was probably my, my favourite passage in the novel, so scene in Thank the novel. Um, but I was particularly interested in the way in which you decided to focus the action from different individual perspectives so that what you were getting was a very personal testimony of, of observing the massacre. Um, was that important to you that you wanted this to be a personal view of, of an atrocity? Yes, it was. Um, and that is true of, of all the um, parts of A Column of Fire which are true stories because even, even though there is real history in A Column of Fire, it's always seen through the eyes of the fictional characters with whom I hope the reader will identify. And that's, um, I mean, without that, it's not really a novel. I mean, you, 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 I, could have, I could have described the massacre of St. Bartholomew in a, dry, in a sort of dryly factual way, mm. but it wouldn't have been very interesting to read. We want to, in a novel, we want to see these things through the eyes of people we know and like mm -hmm. so that when they're in danger we feel anxious for them and when they escape we feel triumphant for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course there's a certain amount of people rescuing one another mm -hmm. as well which, is, um, uh, which adds to the drama. So um, uh, I do think it's actually it's a, it's, it's, it's an essential part of a historical novel that you see scenes like that through the eyes of the fictional mm. characters. It adds to, this, I think, to the sense of fear. I mean, there is a real yes. sense of fear when you're reading it. Good, that, that good. There's <laughs> meant to be. You're, sp you're, you're supposed to be scared. Yes, and, and, it, and it is. And I think part of that is uh, being alongside the characters as they that they don't understand what's happening and, and all of the things that they don't know. But because, very cleverly, you give the machinations that are happening on the other side, that the reader is has a, um, a sort of preferential understanding of what's what's happening but can can see how these other characters are having to to wait and find this information out or not know it and I think that's yes. it's, yeah, it's very well I I think that's very important you see it's it's okay for some of the characters to have partial information mm -hmm. and so to be scared 
uh, or hopeful, uh, have these emotions, but, and something like a massacre or a battle, any scene of big, big action, uh, some of the people will not know what's going on. And um, I've got, Tolstoy was the first person to do this in War and Peace. He described battles as completely confused mm -hmm. affairs where orders were given and never received and um, triumphant skirmishes happened by accident. But actually, and, and of course that's the reality, but I think um, it's very satisfying for the, even if the characters don't understand what's happening, it's very satisfying for the reader to understand what's happening mm -hmm. and what the odds are and what's at stake and so on. So um, I, for my readers, I really like to do that. I don't, I don't want the reader to be confused. The character can be confused, but the reader must never be confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think it, I think it works. Um, and, it, and it sets the stage, I mean, throughout the novel for some really Machiavellian characters and particularly Pierre who I think is a, is a fantastically evil character um, and watching his rise from uh, essentially a nobody to becoming so powerful and um, I mean that must be enjoyable to write a character like Pierre. Yeah. Yes you've got to be a bit careful um, he is of course nasty um, you he needs to be nasty in the right sort of sorts of ways and he's quite cruel mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of it's a bit boring if somebody is physically cruel, if he just punches people, mm. that sort of rare. So, um, so I th tried to think of ways for Pierre to sort of torture people psychologically, mm. um, which is actually worse, um, but also um, it, it, I think it's more intriguing when you're reading if somebody is not just cruel and brutal, but very cleverly and slyly cruel. Mm. And I think the way that he becomes um, intoxicated, I think, by his own cruelty as well, that, that actually, I mean, he begins as somebody who's, who's clearly not, has fairly dubious moral code, but it, it escalates as it, as it goes through. And as he, I think he becomes addicted to that, to that kind of psychological cruelty. And it's very clever, I think, the way that you develop that through, through the novel. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, I certainly was trying to do that. I was trying to show how he started off as, as sort of medium wicked yeah. <laughs> and um, just uh, because of his ambition mm. he just um, became more and more ruthless and unscrupulous and, and, and mean, spiteful. Mm. I think it's interesting that you, you talk about ambition um, and I, I, it seems to me that all the novels in this series are in some ways novels of ambition and the two sides of ambition as well because um, there's a contrast I think between ambition as a force that um, enables people to look beyond their own limitations and the limitations of their of their time, um, you know, developing things that they wouldn't previously have seen, and that's how society moves forward. But also these figures who are undermined by their own hubris. Um, yes. Do you see them in that way? Yes, well? yeah, and uh, I think um, um, characters, at least some of the characters, need to be ambitious because uh, if they're not, then. Where's the drama? Mm. If they just want a quiet life, it's not, <laughs> it's not worth writing a novel about somebody who just wants a quiet well, they life. They probably all have stayed in Kim Kingsbridge. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the my working title for the Pillars of the Earth was Vaulting, and I thought it was a clever title because the novel is mm. about ambition and because the ceiling of mm. a cathedral is known as the Vaulting. Uh, but of course, everybody thought it was about pole vaulting, <laughs> so, so that title was spinned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also struck by the, the stark parallels, actually, between um, the events that you're describing in the 16th century and what's happening today, um, particularly um, sectarianism, terrorism, um, yes. religiously divided society. Um, I wondered whether you think we're prone to see these as modern concepts, whereas in, f in fact they're really not. No, unfortunately, no. Um, religious hatred is, uh, tragically, is fairly timeless. I did think um, that part of the interest of the story would be that in trying to understand religious hatred in the 16th century, we might we might move towards a slightly better understanding of religious mm -hmm. hatred in our own time. Um, I, my feeling about it is um, that they're not that different, that it's the same, 
uh, it's the same sort of syndrome. And um, everything I've learned about history in uh, many years of writing historical novels has led me to think that actually a society that doesn't have that kind of hatred between its people, whether it's religious or racial or other forms of hatred, a society that doesn't have that hatred is unfortunately terribly unusual. Mm. You know, every now and again we achieve in a few places, we achieve a few decades of living together peacefully. And uh, what you have to realize is that that doesn't very often happen and you need to cherish it when it does. Yeah. And again, as in the previous novels, there are some brilliant love stories in here as well. And I, I think the relationships between your characters is, is, is always brilliant. Um, and I think you, you, you really get that conflict between people's religious motivation and their religious belief and how that often interrupts people's personal relationships and, and threatens to com, com jeopardise them and, and in some cases stops them from, from being successful altogether. In some ways that's where religious conflict becomes most vivid mm. when two people are in love and the fact that they belong to different religions mm -hmm. gets in the way and that's of course when the prejudice f f of one religious group towards another religious group looks most stupid mm. because these two people say we adore one another why can't we just be happy they won't let us be happy mm. in some ways every love story is Romeo and Juliet mm. because if the two lovers uh, if two people fall in love and get together and get married and live happily ever after there's no story mm -hmm. I mean it's great when it happens mm -hmm. but it's not a story and um, for a novel you need there to be something in their way mm -hmm so that they're, they're gazing at one another across a crowded room and wishing they could be alone and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And um, th that's, that's where the story comes in. So, um, so uh, it's, it focuses the religious tension. A love story like that focuses the religious mm -hmm. tension and, 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 and shines a spotlight on it. And I think the advantage of having books which have the scope that yours have, taking, taking in so many years, um, is that you're able to see relationships um, beyond the kind of first flush of youth and you're taking them and you see what happens to relationships over the pressures of time and, um, and as people's beliefs change and, and mould with time, I suppose. Um. You're absolutely right. That's exactly how I feel about it. And, and probably the greatest attraction of writing long novels is that you can see the, the character's entire life. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a novel of normal, le normal length is like a, a photograph of the characters at one stage of their life. And it's usually a moment of great crisis in mm -hmm. their lives, but it lasts, you, you see them live through this crisis and then that's the end of the novel if it's about 100,000 words. But, if, but long novels like this, you see them as maybe even as children, but certainly as teenagers. Mm -hmm. And then you see them mature and often get married and have children of their own. And uh, it's, I th it's certainly more satisfying to write. And I think many readers find it more satisfying to read mm -hmm. when you can see, you see all their hopes and, and uh, illusions as young people and you see how all that works out. Mm -hmm. Some of the things they believe in and some of the things they f hope for work out well and some of the things uh, that they believed in as teenagers just turn out to be completely wrong and they realize that and they gain wisdom as as sometimes we do and sometimes we don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're absolutely right that i i love that about writing long novels mm. i can really show how a person's whole life turned out yeah i love it, I love it about reading them as, as well i'm one of the things I've always enjoyed about your novels is that you're strong and strongly political female characters. Um, and this is a, an era of extraordinary women in, in power. Um, Catherine de' Medici, two notable English queens, Mary, Queen of Scots, that, you know, just then, to name but a few. Um, but there's also a sense of real contrast, I think, between women in, in power and the very real difficulties that face 
everyday women and a lot of which are still the same dangers and difficulties which were facing women in your in your earlier novels was that something that you would you were very conscious of when you were when you were writing it yes and i think given that i write about uh, i usually write about women who are quite feisty it's inevitable that at least some of them will be dissatisfied with the role that society mm. offers them at almost any period of our history. Mm. Um, and I focus on that because it's dramatic. Mm. You know, it's part of this person's story that she is learning and growing in this way and she's coming up against these barriers and she's trying to figure out how to get around them. Uh, and um, it's, it's, I am sometimes accused of, of creating women who are too modern for the Middle Ages or the 14th century. Um, but I think there are always women who rebel against mm. this, and the rebels are the interesting ones yeah. to write about. And I, I think you, the, the women that we do know more about, I mean, royal women, for example, certainly don't fall into a, a stereotype of being meek and passive women, so I, I don't know why we would assume that other women would conform to that stereotype. You know, well, the ex except that there's a sort of ideology that is accepted in a token way mm -hmm. about the inferiority of women and and you know anything written well look at the taming of the shrew you know a shakespeare play about about kate exactly the kind of woman that i would write about mm -hmm. and what happens in the taming of the shrew is that she's crushed mm -hmm. and that was fine in in ideologically in the 16th century that doesn't mean it represented reality no and uh, and uh, uh, so, um, s uh, my feeling about it is there's an, there's an ideology about the inferiority of women that isn't really representative of any kind of reality. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, to, certainly doesn't make sense to me. Um, throughout this novel, there's a, a powerful and really visceral sense of the marks that people leave on the on the world around them um, and I think that's been there through the series buildings like the one we're in now I'm um, printing presses the books that people carry and pass on and how they imprint their stories on on their world is it important to how you create such an involving world to give readers a sense of walking through that history of feeling the fabric of the stories woven into the world around them it's very important to have that uh, feel uh, that, that it's a the world, the imaginary world that I've created is concrete. There, there's stuff in it. There, um, there's objects and buildings. And um, uh, when I started this with the pillars of the earth, I really wanted the town of Kingsridge to be fully realized so that you would, I mean, you, you can do a story like that, you see, only describing the things that are absolutely proximate but I wanted the reader to have a sense of the whole place mm -hmm. and how it worked together. Yeah. Because the cathedral was built by the whole town. Mm -hmm. Everybody pretty much in the town had some role to play. Some people were giving money, some people were getting the stone, some people were drawing the plans and so on. Everybody was in some way touched by that. So I wanted that to feel like a real town, where even if, even if you've never been down that street, you know that there is a street and there's something at the end mm. of it and so on. So all of that was important, the clothes that people wore and, uh, and um, how they cooked and the food that they ate and the knives that they carried and all that sort of thing, I think is, you, you've got to, of course, you've got to do it the right way because mm -hmm. nobody wants a list no. um, you know, of all the cutlery in the house or something like that. But you do want, you take the opportunity, if you're going to have people have a dramatic conversation at the table, that is your opportunity to discreetly, without boring anybody, <laughs> tell them what what cutlery was used and what they drank from and whether they had any plates and what the table was like and how comfortable the chair was. You can do all that um, in the course of a scene that is about something else. And, and, and I think you really have to, mm. to give the reader 
the sense that it might be a real place. Mm. And I think you, you, you get that with the, the, the sense of books and, and, and books are really important to this novel and, the, and Sylvie and her, uh, her kind of desire to pass these, these new, yes. you know, translated Bibles on to people. Yeah. There's a real sense of how precious these objects are that yes. they're, and how important they are. To yes. Them, um, yes, and Sylvia, of course, Sylvie's one of the heroes of the story and she's a bookseller, yes. which is she's my favorite. She's my favourite <laughs> character and she has to be my favourite character. <laughs> the, the, the changes in the way that books are used throughout the three books I've written about Kingsbridge are quite interesting. As I recall, um, the library of Kingsbridge Priory in the 12th century had 12 books. That was a library. It's like that Bernard Shaw play where what the scene takes place in a, a library and there's a shelf with three yes. books on it. I forget, that, um, I forget which, which play that is. Um, uh, and then in, in World Without End, Caris writes a pamphlet mm. about how to deal with the plague. And that, of course, that was based on uh, a real phenomenon. Uh, they were called, I think they were called plague tracts, mm. and they were the first practical first aid handbooks. Mm. And, um, and they went all over the world and they were copied and copied, no printing, of course, at the time. They were copied and recopied and added to. Mm. And that was really one of Caris's great achievements. Yeah, that and you have characters program. seeking her out for it. And People yes. come to Kingsbridge and say, I want to buy the yes. plague tract. And now, in the 16th century, many more people can read. Mm. And, of course, we have printing. Printing has been invented. And, and the two things, the invention of printing and the increase in literacy, uh, is what is at the foundation of the of the political revolution of the 16th century, which was Protestantism, because people, uh, that people could buy books, people could read them. The Bible was translated into French and English and German and um, uh, lots of languages. So people could read in that. You didn't have to know Latin. Mm. Uh, and so people read the Bible and said, wait a minute, I'm not sure that the church is right about this because it seems to conflict, and that's how it all begins. Yeah. So the, the, the fight about books, the fact that Sylvie will be executed if mm. she's caught selling a French language Bible, and the risks she takes in going to Geneva mm. to buy some and smuggling them back into Paris, and then hiding them and bringing them out one at a time. Yes, that All scene of where she hides it under the paper is, is in heart, heart in the mouth stuff, I think. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, um, and of course, it's real because that's what people mm. did. They took those risks, they risked their lives in order to bring what they felt was the word of God to their neighbours. So it's, um, uh, it's kind of... And I always... In, in real life and in my books, I admire people who are courageous. Mm. I, it's, a, it's a really important virtue for me. And that's how Sylvie displays her courage, is by taking these terrible risks for something she believes in. Yes. Um, my last question has to be, there's a, there's a suggestion, just a glimmer at the, at the end of the book of the new world. Um, is, is that perhaps where, if you write any future novels in the Kingsbridge series, where that where they might go. When I um, decided to end the book with a reference to the Mayflower, it's really to locate the story in history for people who only know that, mm -hmm. only know that the Mayflower went in 1620. I mean, there, there'll be French people who only know St. Bartholomew's Massacre mm -hmm. and probably English people who only know the Spanish Central Armada Marta, was yes. 1588. <laughs> um, but, but a lot of people, particularly American, uh, North American, South American readers will know that 1620 was the, was the date of the Mayflower. And so I put that in just for that reason, to locate the story in the sweep of history for readers who, um, you know, who are not historians, don't mm. know. Um, but since I've been doing interviews, I think you're the third person who said to me, is this a sign that Kingsbridge is going to be rebuilt in the new world. And I never intended that, but you know what? It's not a bad idea. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to talk to you. You're welcome.